Hello, everybody. Welcome to the sixth and final episode in our Canola Watch webinar series for 2021-22. My name is Jay Wetter. I'm a farm journalist working for the Canola Council of Canada and the editor of Canola Digest magazine and coordinator of Canola Watch, which is the agronomy email you can sign up for at canolawatch.org. I am hosting this webinar today on behalf of the Canola Council of Canada, SAS Canola, Alberta Canola and Manitoba Canola Growers. In fact, if you've watched the other ones and are wondering where I am today, I am actually in the, uh, the SAS Canola office in Saskatoon. The topic today is Make Every Plant Count, Practical Tips to Maximize Your Plant Stand. In this webinar, you will learn about new research in plant establishment, how to improve survival rates of canola seed, and seeding tool optimization for the 2022 seeding season. We have three presenters, Chris Cherowick, Rob McDonald, and Jason Castleman. They will each make short presentations and after the presentations we'll have a question and answer period. And we want your questions, so please use the questions uh, click at the bottom. There's a little, a little icon there for you and you can add your questions in in to me and you can also chat with with me and presenters and everyone involved using the chat function uh, attendees can get a cca credit and we will provide that code later in the webinar here we go we're going to start with chris cherowick who's an agronomist with waterstadt industries he supports sales and marketing and product development departments from a crop performance standpoint Here's Chris. All right, thank you very much, uh, Jay, and uh, good morning, everybody. Hopefully, everyone is uh, staying uh, staying safe, depending on where you are with the uh, with the storm. So, basically, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, <clears throat> making every plant count from an equipment perspective. And uh, with the topics that we're going to be discussing, we could probably spend an hour or two on each of those topics, but. Since we have uh, 10 minutes, uh, we'll go through them briefly and we'll try and articulate them as, as best we can. So uh, you can go to the next slide. So what we're gonna talk about is uh, five different topics uh, relating to equipment. We're gonna discuss seed to fertilizer placement, seed to soil contact, the evenness of plant spacing relating to proper seeding rate, seed depth consistency, and also soil warm up. Uh, next slide. So when we talk about uh, seed to fertilizer, fertilizer placement, uh, we're really wanting to emphasize two of the uh, planks in the 4R nutrient placement, and that is the right place and the right rate. So when we talk about the right place, you know, we want to we want to have that fertilizer positioned where it's you know close, safe, and consistent at fertilizer placement relative to the location of the seed, and so. The, the agronomic benefits of that quick uh, plant establishment are well known, you know, being able to get that crop out of the ground to uh, better compete against weeds and better to compete against, uh, of course, flea beetles as well, too. So when we talk about uh, when we talk about placement, we, re we really want to talk about, you know, return on investment, because, if, you know, if you have if you have fertilizer that's not placed properly, we all know what the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, what the cost of fertilizer is these days. So bad fertilizer placement means that that fertilizer is not going to be used. And uh, so you want to get where that, that fertilizer is going to be taken up by the soil. And uh, one thing that uh, we wanted to, we want to emphasize, and uh, we've heard a lot of conversation in the last number of years, is that to achieve achieve the best yields that we need to focus on more fertilizer and um, so we really want to shift that conversation to instead of having more and focusing on quantity we want, really want to focus on quality you know like where that fertilizer is placed in the soil to get that best return on investment and achieve that uh, that maximum yield next slide so seed to soil contact is is also a very important one that I don't think gets enough uh, gets enough conversation. And uh, when you're putting the seed into the soil, it has to be placed in good soil tilth to be able to access that uh, that moisture and that nutrients. If you place the seed in uh, you know clumpy, blocky, and hard soil that uh, <clears throat> with with a lot of uh, space around it, that nutrient and moisture access isn't going to happen, and that seed is, for lack of a better term, going to sit there. So when you have when you have that good soil tilth, 
sitting around the seed, then you have that quick nutrient and moisture access, and you also have uh, that good root expansion that that uh, is required for those uh, for that plant to be able to grow and get out of the soil quickly. One thing I'll touch on real quickly from an equipment perspective is uh, the Seed Hawk ISB knives do a really good job of this. In that instead of shooting shooting the seed straight down, it shoots the seed sideways into that undisturbed soil. So you have that uh, you have that good soil tilt that the seed gets into. But another benefit is also that seed doesn't have any seed bounce because going back to where that seed is shooting straight down, it can bounce a little bit around in the seed trench. Whereas when you're shooting it into uh, cushioned soil, it's almost like a baseball hitting a, or landing on a pillow instead of a piece of plywood. And uh, so when you go into a field that's seeded with the Seed Hawk ISB knives, you can really see that definition of seed row on the, on the left side of the trench uh, when, when you're looking where the drill has already gone. And so we've seen a lot of success with these knives and it's been really popular with our growers. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about uh, evenness of plant spacing and also how that relates to proper seeding rate as well too. So when you see the picture on the right side of your screen, in the background, you see a crop that was seeded with a competitor drill. And in the uh, foreground, you see a crop that was seeded with the planter. And you'll notice the difference in, uh, in plant spacing, just how much more consistent it is with that singulation. So Jay mentioned in an article uh, back last week, you know, talking about with our, with our temple planter, you know, having seeding rates that need to be based on plants per square foot, not pounds per acre. And over the last uh, number of years, especially, we have seen thousand kernel rates that have gone from anywhere from 3.8 grams to 7.1 grams. And so that is a tremendous difference when say, if you have a seeding rate based on uh, four pounds an acre, the amount of seeds that you're actually putting down can be very, very different. And so when you want to optimize that, uh, that seeding rate and get that good plant spacing, whether it's with, uh, especially with a drill, then that's when, um, you know, just having that uh, thousand kernel weight and determining that plants per square foot is extremely important. Next slide. So when we talk about, uh, you know, the reasons for wanting to, uh, to dial in this seeding rate, you know, we look at uh, what exactly canola is as a plant, you know, it's, uh, it's a small, it's obviously a very small seed related to, uh, to corn, especially when you relate, uh, you know, crops that are typically seeded with planters, uh, you know, corn's a much bigger seed that uh, where the, the ability to uh, plant it eat with an even spacing in the soil is a lot simpler as opposed to the small seed that canola is. But uh, canola grows from that small, from that very small seed into that big bushy plant with a lot of branches and a lot of uh, root system, kind of like what uh, corn is. Obviously, corn's a lot taller, but you get the idea of where just that evenness of plant spacing one by one by one helps you to uh, to build a a better crop. Next slide. So. When we have the evenness of plant spacing, what we're really trying to achieve is, uh, is each plant coming out of the ground and being able to achieve its full, of, full potential. And that means eliminating what I like to call dud plants. Uh, Murray Hartman from, uh, from Alberta Agriculture uh, talked about a couple of years ago how plants that, are, that have a, have a uh, stem diameter of a quarter inch or less produce little to no yields. And you see that in the fields when you go in, uh, not only at that two to four leaf stage, but especially even at, like during uh, swathing or after harvest, where you have stems that are, <clears throat> that are spaced very close together and they're very spindly and uh, really don't have any pods in them, if at all. Whereas, you know, plants that are spaced more evenly together, you know, they're able to produce a robust plant with a lot of pods and actually give you something for yield. And this is especially important where, you know, we talked in the last a couple slides ago about, uh, you know, that return on investment of fertilizer, where, you know, if you have these plants that are spaced close together, they're taking up that, that, that fertilizer and they're taking up that moisture, but they're not giving you anything for yields. So that return on investment with your fertilizer is greatly diminished. And especially with this last couple of years, we've seen with, uh, with moisture levels, being as low as they are, you really want to be able to utilize all that moisture to its uh, full potential. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, coming up here. Uh, next slide. So we talk about uh, you know seeding depth. We want to make sure that each of those seeds is sitting at the same depth. And uh, of course, you know when you go into you have different terrain, but also in a field, you know you can have uh, you know you have rocks, you have 
lumpy soil, you have residue, all these things can affect uh, seeding depth, whether it's with a drill or it's with a planter. So, you know, you really want to make sure that that, uh, that the depth stays consistent. And uh, can we go to the next slide? And when we talk about uh, evenness of uh, depth, we also need to talk about uh, the even the uh, moisture uh, depth in a field because we, especially when we saw last year and the last few years actually, that moisture depth uh, across a field can vary greatly. And uh, so if we look at, uh, I don't think the picture really turned out as great as we hoped, but uh, on, on the one side, you have a field that was uh, planted with a, uh, with a uh, with a competitor planter and then the other side that was planted with a seed hawk and if you look at the uh, look at the field in question it was planted into a uh, field with uh, with corn stems and the field also featured some clumpy soil and rocks so there was uh, so the depth of consistency or the seed depth consistency wasn't as uh, good as it uh, should have been just because of that variability in terrain whereas with the seed hawk drill you know, the, uh, the row units were able to go a little bit more smoothly instead of bouncing around. And so then you really see uh, a much more consistent evenness of emergence as opposed to, uh, as opposed to on, the, uh, on the planter side where some seeds were sitting in moisture, you know, basically a quarter of an inch at the surface. And, uh, and when you have a year, like, like this is pictures taken a couple of years ago where it was so dry and there was no moisture at the top, then you're really gonna see that variability in, uh, in emergence. Next slide. So one of the last things I want to talk about is uh, soil temperature. And I know we've obviously seen uh, a lot of growers get into seeding a little bit earlier, but uh, when, you have, when you have that cooler soil, you know, the, the cooler the soil, the longer that seed is going to sit in, uh, sit in the soil and be subject to, you know, things like, uh, like root uh, diseases and such. And then also the longer it takes to germinate, the more susceptible it's going to be to weed competition and uh, canola. So we want to make sure that soil is going to be as as warm as possible, and uh, making sure that that uh, that that seed row is is clear of residues. So you know, using uh, like the ISB knives and the seed hawk have done a really great job of um, <clears throat> of you know going through that uh, residue, and also you know the row cleaners on the uh, on the temple have done a good job of making sure. That, uh, that, yeah, the seed row is uh, getting the start that it requires in terms of uh, soil warm up. So that pretty much does it for, uh, for my presentation now. Next slide. And uh, I just wanna thank uh, Jay and the staff of the Canola Council again for, for having me and I'll be around for questions later. Right on, thanks, Chris. Chris, there's a question for you in the Q&A but we'll save that till the very end when we do our Q&A session, but if you want to take a look at it and, and think about how you might answer, you could, you could do that. Uh, thanks, John, for the question. Again, anyone who has questions, please use the question icon at the bottom. And we'll get on to Rob McDonald. Rob is the Agronomic Excellence Manager for BASF Canada. His areas of expertise include canola agronomy and plant competition studies. Here's Rob. Thanks, Jay, and good morning, after, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you know, when we're talking about making every plant count and maximizing canola plant stand, I think it's super important that we talk about, well, what exactly are we targeting? Uh, maximizing a canola plant stand does not mean getting as many plants in the field as possible. You know, there was a time when a grower was just thrilled when this canola was, we used to say, thicker than the hair in a dog's back. Well, that's just not the case anymore. Uh, what our research has shown and experience is that we can target a specific population for uh, hybrid canola in particular uh, to maximize performance and consistency to get the most out of the genetics that are on the market today. Uh, next slide, please. The the common thought in the past was that because canola is so plastic, it didn't really matter what type of plant stand uh, you ended up with. In fact, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the more plants, the better. Well, in fact, uh, there is a more ideal plant structure uh, for the field. And as I said, canola is quite plastic in its response to, uh, to population. So I've got these three slides up here, three pictures rather up here showing how canola responds to different plant stand. 
On the left side, we've got, you know, very low plant population. And you can see multiple stems, as many as five stems, maybe more coming off a single plant. You can see that the flowering is, is later on that. So it's impacting the uh, maturity of the plant. And then over on the right side of the screen, we see the impact of a high plant population. And that's where we get into these single stem uh, canola plants. And uh, it can actually push maturity, but also create a lot of stress on, on the plant. Where what I like to see in an ideal canola plant population is two, three stems per plant. So you get uh, a main raceme supported by very strong secondary, secondary stems. Next slide, please. Uh, Chris was talking a little bit earlier too about what ideal populations would look like and how having too heavy a population can actually lead to a situation where you have thin stems and high mortality in the population. There isn't a whole lot of point of putting seeds into the ground that you fully expect are going to die because of mortality. You can see the uh, picture on the lower half of the screen where you see these very small spidly stems that are, there's two things to note here. One. They're very, very slight plants with very thin stems, not robust. And second, very importantly, they're below the canopy of the plants. So these plants aren't going to make a pretty high mortality from this high plant population. Where we see an ideal plant population shown above, a more ideal plant population is shown above, where out of that group of plants taken out of that same foot of row, one foot of row, we've got basically one plant that's below the canopy. So one plant that may not survive. In fact, all those plants may survive. Next slide. The, uh, uh, but the other end of the spectrum, well, we can have too high a plant population leading to significant mortality. We can go with extremely low plant populations they, and they can be successful in, in, in certain years, but there's certain downsides to having a very low uh, population. As I mentioned, multiple tillering, uh, uh, sorry, multiple stems. Uh, and the consequence to that is extended maturity. So if you're in an area that's prone to frost risk, as, as, an, as an example, this can really uh, be a, a significant risk factor to your production season. So having too low a plant population can produce a strong, uh, a strong stand plasticity of the crop. But the downside is you can really drag out the maturity. Another aspect makes timing of uh, fungicides more challenging because you have very extended, you can have a very extended floral window. Uh, next slide, please. Another challenge with targeting, again, too low a plant population uh, is creates real challenges with, with weed control. Just relying on uh, you know, the extensive growth of lateral stems to, to get ground cover can lead to weed escapes. And, uh, you know, with the challenges we have today with resistant populations, we need all the help we can get uh, for, for managing weed populations. And canola at a correct target stand is a very strong competitor and can really be a contributor to effective weed control. Next slide, please. I mentioned this already, but it's it's visualized quite nicely in this in this slide here. We've got a couple Invigor products uh, sown at different seeding rates, anywhere from 25 seeds per meter squared rate up to 141 seeds per meter squared. And you can see as you go from left to right, in particular on the 258H PC on the left side, how as we go up in seeding rate, we accelerate the maturity uh, of the crop. And uh, in particular, it highlights that these, you know, relatively low seeding rates, 25 seeds per meter squared, 47 seeds per meter squared, where we really draw out uh, the maturity. And, and I already talked about the, the risks is about having uh, a crop that's uh, impacted by, um, I'd say, an early uh, late season frost. Next slide, please. The, uh, another impact, and we, we particularly saw it in the this past past season with the very hot, dry conditions we experienced in much of the prairies, is that we can see an impact of having too high a population on the ability to handle uh, drought, and uh, where we have very high stem counts, very thin plants, not very well developed root systems. 
much more susceptible to, uh, to, to drought stress. Next slide, please. So what has the research shown to date? Well, the research has shown very clearly to date that uh, growers in Western Canada should be targeting somewhere between five to seven plants uh, per square foot. This really represents a, an optimum uh, population and, uh, and, and a range is an, is, is a, an appropriate way to, to target a population. Not, you're not necessarily trying to target 4.5 or 5.5, but you know anywhere between five to seven plants is a good target to, uh, for establishing a strong canola plant stand. Now recognize it's gonna take more than five to seven seeds to establish that plant stand. Currently, uh, we see uh, in our trials across Western Canada, approximately 65% uh, establishment rate. So it takes about 10 seeds per square foot to achieve this target population on average. And uh, that's, that's where we see all the benefits I talked about earlier in terms of of uh, uh, acceptable ma maturity, uh, good standability. And uh, the other aspect is, this is where we see as evidenced by this, uh, uh, this simple graph here, our best yield response as well. Next slide, please. Our findings from our own research uh, are well supported by uh, research in peer-reviewed articles. Uh, this particular meta-analysis put together by Murray Hartman a couple of years ago, and uh, it really highlighted that uh, plant densities above roughly uh, 40 plants per meter squared produce 90% of, of the yield. And you see between 90 and 95% is basically 40 to 70 plants per meter squared, which is very close to this uh, five to seven plants per square foot that, uh, that, that we advocate as a uh, ideal target plant population. So we've got very good agreement with uh, data from our own trials and with the data that's been published in uh, peer reviewed articles over the years. Next slide, please. So there you have it. Uh, five to seven plants can really maximize your yield results and get you consistent performance out of, uh, out of uh, hybrid canola, Invigor hybrid canola. And the, um, you know, as far as uh, maximizing uh, your plant stand, happy to answer questions during the, uh, the Q&A session, but I think it's really important. I wanted to highlight the importance of know what you're after, uh, count, your, uh, count your stand, understand what your emergence is, and then target your seeding rate based on that experience. Thanks for that. Great, thanks, Rob. Uh, and I see we've got another question. So Rob and Chris, you can take a look at those and see what we've got so far and plan your answers. Um, but we've, before we get to the Q&A, we've got Jason Castleman, who's my colleague with the Canola Council of Canada. Uh, Jason is a agronomy specialist with the Canola Council and is the team lead on precision agriculture, plant establishment and profitability. Here's Jason. Thanks very much, Jay. And uh, so thanks for, this is our, our final uh, webinar in our series for the Canola Watch webinars. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to be with everyone here today. Uh, Cass, could I get the next slide, please? So our uh, crop production and innovation team includes 10 agronomy specialists located throughout Western Canada. And we're focused on those areas of ensuring sustainable and, and a growing supply of canola. Uh, each of our um, of the team has unique strengths related to research, leadership, coordination, knowledge creation, and transfer, and preparing for emerging threats and supporting regulatory and market access efforts. Next slide. Our objective of the topic of making every plant count for the Canola Watch webinar is to promote key areas in the best management practices that will help can Canadian canola farmers in Western Canada increase productivity and move towards the industry's 2025 goal of 26 million tons of production and an average yield of 52 bushels per acre. Next slide. So with the Canola Council, we do have five agronomic priorities for canola. And right now they're using four nutrient management practices, choosing the best seed traits for each field, achieving that uniform five tape plants per square foot, identifying and managing the top yield robbers, 
and harvesting all seeds and delivering them at number one grade. Next slide. The number three priority is to achieve a uniform five tape plants per square foot and the canola plant population target of five tape plants per square foot is a safe target to balance yield potential and economics. Canola Council of Canada research found that stands of five to six plants per square foot yielded about five bushels per acre more than stands that averaged two to three plants per square foot. Meta-analysis conclusion was that canola farmers seeking to maximize returns should target populations greater than five plants per square foot and the plant populations lower than this will almost always have yield loss. Since canola plants in a low population density grow larger and branch more, they tend to mature later. And those secondary branches account for up to 80% of the yield for canola crops with only two plants per square foot. Those plants will have a wide range of maturity creating yield and quality losses and simply due to the inability of time to align with all plants and harvest limitations. Those Extra branching in very thin stands can delay seed maturity up to 21 days depending on environmental conditions. CanolaCounts.ca is an online crowdsourcing tool to help growers, agronomists, and crop scouts drive the adoption of plant establishment assessments while tracking progress towards the canola industry production goals. Agronomy recommendations are often based on probabilities, but practice is most likely to achieve the desired outcome. This is important to note because canola crops with a thin stem can yield fairly well in certain circumstances. Canola is often called a flexible or plastic crop because individual plants can adjust the number of size of branches and pods they produce in response to additional moisture, light, and nutrients. As a result, canola is a famous ability to compensate for a bad start as long as it does get that long season and clear sailing along the way. The challenge with a thin stem is that those plants will be bigger and with more yield coming from those side branches and more time for that crop to be harvest ready, that lower seeding rate or lower emergence percentages in all fields can also be patchy. And this will further reduce yield potential and increase management challenge. And a crop with bald patches and plants with different pruning diseases is a big challenge to optimize for spraying and harvest timing. Next slide. So uniformity across the field will lead to consistent canola growth stage timing and will help with planning and executing field operations like pesticide applications and harvest. By taking regular plant counts, growers and agronomists can identify challenges and implement changes such as optimizing seeding rates and speeds to achieve that uniform five-day plants per square foot in future seasons. For remote counting, the Canola Council ran a Canola Counts Citizen Science Program in 2021. Reflective of the challenging spring for some farms, Emergence percentages ranged from below 20% to over 90%. Yet yeah, while emergence rate was low to average, most fields had a stand of that five to eight plants per square foot. Canola Council will run that Canola Counts program again this spring. And please go to canolacounts.ca to enter your counts. I encourage growers to take steps ahead of the seeding season to implement a plant stand strategy and work to improve emergence that will pay dividends throughout the growing season. Canola stands with enough plants that emerge evenly across the whole field have the best chance of realizing yield goals. And these stands are the most efficient at utilizing applied resources and provide the best return on investment. While seeding, growers need to monitor field conditions and check seeding performance at soil conditions as soil conditions change from field to field or in different areas in the same field. Prepare to adjust that seeding equipment to achieve the end goal of a competitive high yielding crop. Next slide. The number four priority is to identify and manage those top yield robbers in each field. Integrated pest management challenges include disease, weeds, and insects, and the economic thresholds exist for each of those pests, and the implementation forms a backbone of an integrated pest management plan. Next slide. Phosphorus fertilizer should be sidebanded when high rates are needed. This can be done with a combination of seed row placement at safe rates and a sideband or spring band placement as it is better to apply phosphate fertilizer in the soil at a time when crop can access it early in its growth cycle. This is a conclusion from Jessica Pratchler and Stuart Brandt's Enhancing Canola Production with Improved Phosphorus Fertilizer Management Study. The Pratchler study also found that foliar phosphorus applications are not a good alternative to seed place applications unless the field is known to be highly deficient in that less than 10 plant parts per million of phosphorus in the toxic sensors of soil and know what their applications are made. Patrick Mulecki's study of reducing toxicity of seed place fertilizer in canola found that damage from seed place phosphorus can be reduced by increasing the width 
of single shoot openers from one inch to four inch and using a narrower row spacing, nine inches instead of 12 inches, which increases seabed utilization. Next slide. With the ever-increasing yield potential of newer canola hybrids, phosphate nutrition in this crop is crucial to ensure that yield potential is optimized. Researchers Jessica Bratchler and Stuart Brandt from the Northeast Agricultural Research Foundation found that predicting the degree of damage caused by seed place fertilizer is very difficult as it is influenced by other factors such as soil texture, soil organic matter, and moisture. And since these factors vary considerably across most fields, damage can be quite variable across the various landscape positions. Furthermore, even adding a small amount of ammonium sulfate to phosphorus in the seed row can increase damage to seeds and reduce canola emergence. Therefore, this practice should be discouraged. Overall, research has found no evidence. Better responses associated with seed place phosphorus over sideband, even at low rates, and that high rates of sideband phosphorus are always equal to or greater than seed place. And this was true for stand establishment and yield. Yield improved with high phosphates rates in general, and in some cases were found to be even greater with sideband treatments, especially at higher rates. Optimum canola yields were reached between that 70 and 80 pounds of fertilizer phosphorus. Therefore, if rates of phosphorus required, fertilizer phosphorus should be sidebanded to minimize seed damage and maximize yields, as it is the most consistent and beneficial application method due to minimize seed damage and high plant populations achieved as a result of sideband, providing the benefit, added benefit of reduced days to maturity, which will lower green seed risk. Levels of plant available phosphorus are drifting lower in many fields in Western Canada, and this hidden hunger will be hurting yields. Phosphorus rates that at least match crop removal are necessary to maintain soil productivity. Next slide. Seed row placement is best for the first 15 to 20 pounds per acre of phosphate, as it may improve emergence and seedling vigor on deficient or cool soils where available, availability is reduced. Larissa Grenko with the University of Manitoba presented research on seed place phosphorus and sulfur fertilizers and the effect on the canola plant stand and yield based on the findings led by Cynthia Grant of AAFC Brandon, where evaluated improved practices for phosphorus, sulfur, and nitrogen management in canola, found that applying phosphorus and sulfur fertilizers in a blend increased the frequency and severity of damage with plant stands re reduction by as much as 57% and an average of 18% overall. The high ammonium sulfate blends caused the most damage, resulting in an overall average plant stand reduction near 20%. As for yield, the greatest and most consistent yield increase resulted from the combination of a high uh, phosphorus, low ammonium sulfate treatment. However, due to a high salt index, zebra applications that include ammonium sulfate does come with a high risk of ammonium toxicity. Grenko concluded that in order to meet, maximize the benefits and minimize the risk of applying hot, highly available phosphorus and sulfur, farmers with a single shoot, low seabed utilization seeding equipment should reserve the limited tolerance of canola for seed row fertilizer to phosphorus. Next slide. Plant counts help quantify the success of canola stand establishment in a given field. Multiple counts averaged across the field will give an average plant density for that field, which can be compared to the target plant density and emergence percentage. The average number or percentage of seedings that have grown out of the number of plants seeded this spring. Understanding that each field's plant density and emergence percentage, the average number of seedlings that have grown out of the number of seeds planted this spring will help management decisions in that field that season and will identify areas for improvement for future seasons. Enter plant counts from your canola field at canolacounts.ca, the crowdsource survey. Next slide. For all methods of counting plants, several counts per field are required to get a good representative average plant density and emergence percentage. The average number of seedlings that have grown out of the number of seeds planted this spring. If emergence is patchy, dig up those parts of those seed rows to look for non-germinated or non-emerged seeds and plan to return and reassess. If canola density and staging is not uniform throughout the whole field or in patches, make note of those areas and then investigate the cause. Dry soil, frost may be difficult to avoid, but plants stunted or lost because of poor seed placement, fertilizer placement, or fertilizer rates and surface residue can serve as an indication of a weakness in the stand establishment system. Monitoring fields should start 10 days after seeding and if conditions are good, 15 days if conditions are cool. 
If plant stand is lower than expected for the given seeding rate, seeding size, and estimated seeding survival, check equipment settings, seed characteristics, and field conditions to identify why ideal plant population is not achieved. The cause or causes may relate to the seeding operation, such as inconsistent depth, excessive fertilizer placement, seed or mechanical issues, and frost or wind or flooding, insects or disease or herbicide residue also being factors. When stands are spotty and thin, careful management is required to preserve the surviving plants. More conservative thresholds may be warranted for insects, weeds, and diseases. Next slide. Research shows that there is plenty of potential to improve yields by customizing our approaches to soil zones, disease management, insect pressure, and weather. And a key to growth is providing the best agronomic information and advice for each unique farm operation based on the latest science. We believe that there are yield gains that can be achieved by implementing five agronomic priorities on farm, and this will help growers achieve the industry goal of 52 bushels per acre. Next slide. The Canola Council has several resources available online, including Canola Encyclopedia, Canola Research Hub, Canola Digest, and please sign up for the Canola Watch, free, unbiased, timely, and research-focused newsletter. Thanks very much, Dave, for helping put together the, the Canola Watch series and uh, open it up for questions. Right on. Thanks, Jason. So, Cass, we'll have everybody up on the screen together. And I think, Cass, did you want to show that CCA code now or save it to the end? I'll leave that up to you if it pops up now. People, make sure to scan that QR code and get your credit. We've got a few questions pouring in, so that's good. I've got a few of my own, but it looks like we'll, we'll click along nicely with participation from, from the audience, which is what we want. We'll do Q&A for about 20 minutes, and then I'll get a, each of the three presenters a chance to do a 30-second last word, and then we'll sign off uh, at the top of the hour. All right, we'll go through this in order. So John asked a question. This is for Chris. Um, we've got everybody there now. Oh, Chris is there. Yep. Um, discuss the impact of high rates of nitrogen in a side band impacting germination rates and access to P co-banded uh, co with the nitrogen. Okay, so that's the question. Uh, maybe I should say it again because I was reading it kind of funny. But uh, so high rates of nitrogen in a side band and how that may impact germination rates, especially when you've got the phosphorus in there in a coal band with the nitrogen. Do you wanna comment on that, Chris? Yeah, you betcha, that's a really good question. And uh, so obviously, like we talked about earlier, we wanna, we wanna try and make sure that all of those plants germinate and grow and uh, get the survivability as high as possible. So one thing I will comment on is, uh, is having that ability to adjust fertilizer rates depending on your soil conditions, because you can have, you can have these high rates of nitrogen, but if you, don't have, if you don't have the moisture, which is your biggest yield limiting factor, you're not going to achieve those high yields anyways. So if you have those, uh, if you have those dry conditions, then you should dial back your fertilizer rates uh, accordingly. And uh, one thing that uh, I'll also talk about is uh, you can also you can also place uh, P in the seed knife, but then you also want to use your discretion as well too. Especially you know with a uh, when you have seed hawk openers that have that narrow narrower row space or narrower narrow opener, I guess, if you want to call it that, you can, you can use a little bit of uh, P for a starter, but uh, that'll also depend on your conditions too. If it's dry, you might want to hold off on, uh, on that. Uh, and what I will advise guys to do is to, uh, you know, when you look at the provincial recommendations for, uh, for fertilizer rates, especially, you know, seed placed uh, FOSS, uh, you'll, that, that uh, recommendation was made, I believe, at uh, one inch, um, one inch spread at uh, 10 inches of row spacing. So you'll want to adjust your uh, rates up based on your uh, seed bed utilization. If you're going with a seed hawk at, uh, you know, 5% at 12 inch spacing with an ISB knife and 6% at uh, 10 inch spacing. So hopefully that covers that question. Yeah, that seed bed utilization is an important consideration, but I, I wanna dig, I'm gonna go to Jason with this, but it's a part B to that question. So let's dig into this dry soils because there's a lot of, farms with, with dry soils this spring, although Rob says that there's a bit of moisture happening in, in southern Alberta today, which is good, at least his part of southern Alberta. Anyway, um, just on, on that, so, so the recommendation is say 20 pounds per acre of P205 in the seed row. And Chris, you said you maybe could, should dial it back if it's dry conditions. Jason, what, 
Would you have a, a specific number on, on how much to dial it back? Yeah, for sure. There, there's definitely, um, you know, a, an opportunity for, for growers to limit the amount of um, fertilizer damage. So there's fertilizer damage comes from, from two areas, either from the salt or from the ammonia toxicity. And in a dry condition, the concentration of those salts is not going to be as, as diluted as it is if there is some, some higher moisture conditions. And so those recommendations of that, uh, you know, and, and the 15 to 20 pounds is, uh, is, is, a, is a conservative enough number. I think, you know, we can get, at, um, you know, some, some of the provincial recommendations might go as high as 25 pounds of actual phosphorus. And uh, so under, under less than ideal conditions, the amount of risk that um, an individual grower is willing to, to take. And uh, there's, you know, if you if there is an opportunity of splitting out that phosphorus and getting it away from the seed row, the um, after after anything more than that fifth, that first fifteen pounds is is probably the best way to do it. So, uh, is there a is there a, a hard number of saying what how much to dial it back based on how dry conditions are? Uh, not uh, there, you know, the drier it is, the the more potential for for or the more risk. And uh, so the, the least risk averse uh, grower is, is probably going to be quite limited on the amount of fertilizer that he wants to place in that seed row. Yeah, good. Rob, do you have a comment on that before we get to the next one? Can't hear you, Rob. Uh, the, Wait, cha the challenge oh, of, the, of yeah. the mute button. Yeah. The, uh, you know, as far as uh, the, the challenges with the dry, dry conditions and uh, fertilizer talks, I think they've been well, well described here. Uh, I think it's particularly important this year, uh, particularly after some relatively low yielding fields last year to do get out there and soil test in that zone. Uh, my expectation is there's lots of FOSS in, in that layer. I don't think we need a pile with the seed this year. Uh, why smoke some seed when uh, there's likely a lot more there than in previous seasons, just based on a lot less extraction last year. So I think that's important to keep that in mind uh, and get out there and do some soil testing in that zone because, um, uh, you know, uh, with some of the yields we took off, there's a lot of, fertilizer, a lot of FOSS in particular sitting out there. So not somewhere where I'd be pouring a pile of money into that that'd be my my recommendation okay good thanks rob keep your mic on because the next one's for you and uh and chris and jason can answer this too but we'll start with you so the the you know especially as you're getting you showed that graph of you know how the yield drops off with lower plant populations and this question is about the you know when you're at those that lower end of that recommended range even below that recommended range how essential uh, uniformity is so you you so you want to have you know three or four or five ideally five plants per square foot but you want that uniform across the field so okay so the question is for you Rob can you just discuss the impact of plant uniformity versus the overall plant population you bet uh, you know we're always talking about averages and uh, doesn't do you much good to have two plants per square foot in one part of the field and, and eight in the other. And guess what? You got an average of five as mission accomplished. Uh, you know, uniformity is extremely important uh, for the timing of all, all your operations. And, uh, you know, I'll just talk about uniformity a little bit. We didn't talk too much about seed depth and residue management uh, in, in the webinar. So I'll just touch on that because I think it's, it's, it's highly relevant. The one thing that, often doesn't get discussed and I hate to say it, it's already too late for this season, but you know, good seeding starts at harvest. Uh, the number one thing you can do to uh, improve your canola plant stand is do a good job chopping your straw and distributing it because everything else is a band-aid for addressing inadequate residue management. That's where dividends are paid. So chop that straw, uh, spread it, uh, it's, it's, it's really some of the best money you can spend on the farm because everything else is a band-aid to address that. Dealing with heavy chaff row, this, these are real uh, contributors to mortality, uh, to disease, to 
uh, reduce plant stand. So uh, just, you know, I know it's a little bit late to discuss that now, but I, I, I just wanted to highlight that. Second is uh, particularly for no-till and um, uh, min-till guys is, uh, again, dealing with residue little value like you know um there was a time we always talked about shallow seeding when i first started growing canola if we didn't have seed on the surface you had a problem um it was too deep stranding seed in residue is not a recipe for successful stand establishment you got to get it below the residue layer and everybody's got a residue layer don't plant seed in the residue layer. We got to get below that. You got to get below the moisture as well in, the, in a season like this. You got to get at least a quarter inch below the moisture line. So these are things that you can do to improve, improve your plant stand uniformity because that's, that's critical. Get your seeding rate correct and establish a uniform plant stand. And you do that by getting the seed into moisture, into soil with good, as uh, Chris talked about, good seed to soil contact. Uh, did, did, I, did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, so Jane? I think we'll, yeah, thanks, Robin. We'll, we'll we'll throw this to Chris and Jason. Chris first, anything you want to add on on that? Uh, the, first, the uniformity, and then if you want to talk about, you know, placement within, you know, getting through the residue for good placement in the soil. So uniform, uniformity versus plant population. You got, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, yeah, you betcha. I mean, because when you have, when you have good plants, plant spacing in the row, you're going to have a better survivability because you don't, you're not going to have those two plants that are competing for nutrients and for moisture. And uh, because oftentimes, you know, you go in at the cotyledon stage or even say around that two leaf stage and you see a whole bunch of plants that are sitting kind of clumped together. And then you go back towards, you go back at the end of the year and you see, you know, there was only a few of those, uh, of those plants left. When you have that good, uh, that good uniform spacing in the row, you're going to eliminate that and you're going to have that uh, uniformity that's going to allow for those plants to expand and you're going to have as i said that better uh, survivability of especially well singulation is definitely the the best way of metering seeds there's so there's no question about that uh to expand on uh, rob's uh, comment i definitely agree that uh, managing residues as at harvest is is going to set the table for your success for your seeding crop. Now, whether it's you know using a planter and trying to eliminate that uh, clumpy residue and stuff that can affect uh, you know row unit operation, or even if you're seeding into it, you know just having uh, you know that evenness of maturity where you know. The, the plant that doesn't have that isn't going through residue is going to grow nice and tall whereas a plant that's fighting with uh, residue to try and establish i mean it, it's just a no-brainer that you want that seed row to be as clean as possible jason anything more there i just say you know again uniformity like uh, like was mentioned is is actually uh very important it starts at uh, the year before at harvest time spreading that uh, that crop residue and uh you know getting Getting everything across the field uh, evenly, we don't have time to, you know, come back to to the field uh, more than once. If there's some staginess in the crop, we we have to be able to, uh, uh, you know, spray the crop all at once. Uh, whether it's for a herbicide application or a uh, fungicide application, harvest time, whether it's for swath timing, the whole field, if it's even, uh, it's for straight cutting for combining. If everything is even, there's just such a smoother, you know, everything is well, well in place and, and, and pays dividends uh, over the long, over the rest of the, the whole season is, uh, is going to pay on uniformity. So I want to, before we leave this topic of uniformity, I want to pick up on something Chris said. And, and it's just about the, what is uniformity? And I think the key is, you know, let's have the, try to have about the same number of plants per square foot across the field. Now, while a planter is excellent at this singulation, Rob, I'm going to go to you with, with a comment here. I, I think the, the singulation down the seed row, while, while can have obvious benefits, there's lots of, plant, lots of drills and, and seeding tools across the prairies that are not planters, but I think can do a very good job of, of plant establishment, um, even if they're not getting that that precise one and a half inch, two inch, whatever, uh, spacing down the row. So Rob, can you just comment on that, please? Yeah, we, we, look, we spent a lot of time looking at uh, stand uniformity and uh, 
you know, uh, one of the best times for looking at stand uniformity is again, we'll come back to the fall, uh, just a great opportunity to look at, at, uh, at stocks and still get out there and have a look at your stocks. The lot, the, the number one thing you have to avoid, we can talk about optimum plant stands and uniformly went up, but what we have to avoid is unseeded crop. Uh, because, you know, that is our goal is to establish crop that first and foremost. So when you're walking out, out in the field and, and you're stomping around in your size 12s, you got basically 12 inches underfoot. There better be a stock under every footprint in the field because that is just lost productivity. And when you have these blanks in the field where you have no productivity, it's actually just somewhere for a weed to grow. This is a big problem. This is one of the real challenges when you start cutting seed rate too much. Because I hate to say it, but the Band-Aid for, uh, for um, uh, poor stand uniformity is seed rate. That is, you just bump your seed rate and you fill in those spaces. So you want to do a good job with your, with your seeder. But if you're too low and you start having all these blanks in the field, that is just lost productivity. We don't have to talk about what an ideal population looks like. You have no population underfoot. And uh, that is just lo loss in productivity. And what you also have is neighboring plants in those blank spaces that are now going to be much later maturing. It's not going to contribute to standing uniformity. So today, right now, you don't have to, you know, we're not producing picket fence uh, canola out there. Um, there's a lot of hurdles to, to, to doing that. I, I try every year. I try to produce the picket fence canola. We've got planters we're testing, uh, you know, pretty exhaustively. Still haven't made that picket fence the crop I'd like to see, but even with existing tools, with proper maintenance set up, with good seed at the right rate, you can produce an outstanding stand, but you have to avoid that unutilized crop space that I was just talking about. So Chris, I'm going to go to you with this because I know, so you're, you're with a company that has both planters and you've got the independent link. So the, yep. the, the more traditional style. Um, and I, I'm assuming you're going to tell me that they can both do a pretty good job. Well, one thing that, uh, like when we talk about the subject of drills, I mean, obviously, you know, a drill doesn't have the singulation that a planter does. However, you know, you can still optimize your, you can still optimize your plant performance by way of two things. And the first is your seed metering. I mean, you want it to be as accurate as possible. And, uh, and shameless plug of our meters have shown, our Phoenix 3 meters have shown to do a really good job with our canola row canola rollers and planting as accurate of a seeding rate as possible. The other thing is the final placement in the soil. As I mentioned before, you know, you want that seed to get into really good soil. So it has that quick, early nutrient and moisture access. And so then when you have that, you're going to have a lot less chance of uh, seedling mortality. Okay, well, we've got two more questions here. So I want to get to them. Uh, so Uvi asks about and, and re-ask the question if I don't get this right. But and, I, and I'm going to go to Jason with this. Um, so with the carryover soil fertility, uh, is there a relationship between what's in the soil versus seed density? So if you've got, you know, a certain amount of carryover or, and let's add the fertilizer in there. Is there a density target that aligns with your fertility availability or are they separate concepts? Yeah, I think there's, I think there's a couple of different things going on there for sure. You know, a, a field that does have good background fertility or, or applied fertility is, um, you know, based on the yield target that you're that you're trying to achieve, is, um, you know, you need the you need the plants there to make it happen, and uh, and that's where you know based on the research that uh, that was done, you know, it, that that five to six, five to seven, five to eight, and and the reason that we would add, you know, so. The question that we get sometimes is, do you know why do we need eight plants sometimes? And you know, considering where we are, um, myself, we farm in in the uh, north of Fairview in the Cleardale area, and so maturity is a challenge for us, right? Every year, so getting getting the crop harvested uh, before it starts snowing in in October or whatever is is always a challenge. We want we need to uh, to make things happen a little bit quicker. If we've got those longer that longer season, then then no big deal. But the amount of fertility is is going to be based on your on your target uh, uh, yield potential. And so, a five five to eight five to seven plants is is still 
is still the right number, even based on, on the fertility that you have. The, the advantage that, that good, good fertility is going to do or background fertility is um, it, the, the amount of, the amount of uh, pods and seeds that, that do get produced on those, uh, on those stems and branches. Uh, moisture is also going to be a huge factor there too, for sure. So, you know, there's setting it up right, starting, starting with the right number of plants is uh, regardless of, of what's going to happen for the rest of the growing season is always, is always going to be the right thing to do. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to that. I just want to get in this one question from Wayne and I'm going to go to you with this one too, Jason. Has there been any research to verify how much sulfur is released per year on a typical application of biosol when it's recommended for only one application for five years of supply? Do we, do you have anything on that? I haven't seen anything on that, but I don't see everything or even. No, so I, I know I've, from within our, uh, within the Canola, the Canola Council, I know I was, uh, I was looking at, I saw that question and I was looking it up on the uh, Canola Research Hub and I, you know, that's a, it's an awesome resource for anybody who's looking for information about, you know, what research has been done on, on a number of things. And I know that we do have a, a section on there about uh, sulfur fertilizer and, uh, and so biosol being a, uh, um, you know, a component of that product is elemental sulfur. Elemental sulfur does have to be, uh, uh, you know, there is, there's a certain amount of uh, uh, breakdown or a release of that sulfur that, you know, to convert it into a sulfate form that the, that the crop would use. So there's definitely some, some factors there that have to occur. And it, so is the research done to verify, you know, not within the Canola Council uh, information that I, I was able to look at. And, uh, but I would, I would definitely, you know, ask the, uh, the, the folks that, that are dealing with your that product to, uh, you know, maybe supply some information or some of the research that, that they're aware of, or maybe some, uh, if they could direct it to some third party independent research that also has been done on, on how that the uh, release of, of sulfur from elemental sulfur to the canola crop. Okay, I've got one more quick question. I'm going to go to Rob with this. And I want a quick answer, Rob, as quick as possible. But so we've got the range. I mean, you use five to seven, the canola council is used as five to eight. They're basically the same. But in dry conditions, uh, dry soil conditions in spring, why might a farmer want to be working or targeting the lower end of that, that five to seven, five to eight range? Can you do that in 30 seconds? If I understand the question, uh, I, I would say in dry conditions, the, um, let's not talk about the target population. Let's talk about how many seeds you got to put in the ground. We've, you know, have got one chance to seed properly and, uh, uh, and dry conditions, you have to err on the high side. You can't, uh, you don't want to drop below, uh, th those targets. And, uh, you know, you're going to need the 10 seeds per square foot going into, into dry conditions, um, to, to achieve, to achieve your target. Um, I, I, I'm reluctant to say, uh, you should be targeting the low end of the, the five to, to, to seven. We don't know how the year will unfold. All we can deal with is the conditions we're presented right now at seeding. And, uh, you know, to cut seeding rate in uh, going into dry soils is not, is not a good idea. Okay, good. Thanks, Rob. All right, we're going to get 30 seconds each for a sign off. We'll go in the order of presentation. So, Chris, Rob, Jason. Chris. Okay, you betcha. So basically, the, the main message that I'm uh, bringing today is precision placement for return on investment. Now, whether that's for seed or whether that's for fertilizer, if we want to maximize the amount of dollars that we're putting into these two commodities, precision placement is in the soil is the key. Uh, thanks, Chris. Rob? Uh, seeding for success. Uh, five to seven plants is a great target. 65% uh, as a rule of thumb for uh, for average emergence equals 10 seeds per square foot. Uh, if, you, if you're doing plant counts on the farm, uh, you can fine tune that based on, on your experience. Thanks, Rob. Jason, last word. Head over to canolacounts.ca, sign up for uh, uh, the opportunity to, to do some counts in your field here this, uh, this growing season after establishment. And uh, if you're looking for, uh, for a canola counts hoop, let uh, one of your uh, uh, Canola Council agronomists know that, you're, that you need some hoops to, to count with and uh, look forward to uh, this canola growing season uh, 
uh, in 2022. Right on. Thanks, Jason. All right. So Cass is going to show everybody the CCA code one last time. And that wraps up the Canola Watch webinar series for 2021-22. For recordings of this webinar, uh, which will be posted within a couple of days, and all the five previous webinars, please go to youtube.com slash canola council. I also have podcasts based on these webinars. You can find them at canolawatch.org, O-R-G, in the gray panel on the right-hand side. Thanks again to today's presenters, Rob McDonald, Chris Cherwick, and Jason Castleman. And thanks to Cass Cardi for her behind the scenes work. And finally, thanks to the host organizations, Canola Council of Canada, Manitoba Canola Growers, SAS Canola, and Alberta Canola. And I guess there is one more thank you, and that's to thank you to you for attending and brushing up on your canola agronomy skills. See you next time. I'm Jay Wetter.